If you ask, how does the brain work from an engineering perspective, then you might ask, oh, what does the circuit diagram look like? After all, if complex modern processors are designed and understood by engineers, then maybe a simple brain uh, could be likewise understood at that level. So let's consider exactly that, a simple processor. And if you take the lid off, you'll find underneath the, the die, the chip. Looking at it a little bit closer, you'll see that it's broken up into uh, various modules for uh, processing, for inputs from various uh, sources, and for outputs, memory, and, and likewise in the control. If you look at a small region and zoom in on it, you'll find it's covered by a vast mesh of tiny, tiny wires. Uh, this is about maybe a dozen layers thick. Underneath it all, there are the actual switches, the transistors, uh, which do the, the switching on this. Now, if you want to make it, you just need a few billion dollars, machines like this, and uh, you're, you're good. If you want to reverse engineer it, then maybe you could use some machines like this as one example, uh, which I'll be discussing in more detail, called a fib sim. Now, on the other end, here's another processing unit. Let's take the cover off, and underneath, there's a brain. And it, too, has various modules in it, you know, optical inputs, they're called optic lobes, antenna inputs for smell, memory units. They all have different names, mushroom bodies, ellipsoid bodies, and so forth, studied by biologists. So you can also zoom in and look very carefully, and presumably there's also going to be a vast mesh of wiring in there, and somehow buried in underneath all of that should be synapses, which are switching between all of these different wires. Now, if you want to make one of these, you need to invest in an old banana <laughs> and wait, not much cost, and it'll self-assemble. And it's, it's amazing, and you've heard about this you know, in the first talk, and it's, it's, it's truly amazing. So now if you want to reverse engineer it, uh, we really need, it's a tough problem, and we need tools from across the spectrum, from biology, from genetics, and I'll talk a little bit of the aspect that can come in from the semiconductor industry, that uh, FibSem. So just to put a, a perspective, let's put the, some dimensions on these and compare them side by side. A current processor uh, is sort of a flattened structure, two and a half dimensions, but the volume of it is under a millimeter. Uh, the fruit fly, uh, it's a nice little blob under a millimeter in size, uh, but not too different in the volume. The number of transistors and switches in the processor are getting pretty impressive, about a billion transistors nowadays. Uh, that's a bit more than the fruit fly. If you go back 10 years, the Pentiums, they had about a comparable number. And the last part now is the, the wire size and the transistor size and the dendrite size, synapse size. They're all in the tens of nanometers, uh, very small. And the challenge is to bridge the gap between the small size of a, a few nanometer, of tens of nanometers all the way up to a good fraction of a millimeter and catch that large dynamic range. So to reliably resolve these transistors in all three dimensions, we need to sample uh, probably instead of 50 nanometers, maybe at five or 10 nanometer increments. These are the voxels that you'd use to form images, and you've seen before, one can sort of collect many such images in 3D, form a stack. But if you just quickly look at the numbers, how many voxels, how many pixels are there? Eight nanometers compared to half a millimeter, they're, they're lots. They're, it's a good fraction of a petabyte, and if you're acquiring the data at a modest rate of a, a megahertz, uh, then you'd be acquiring data for eight years, even for something simple as a, a fruit fly plane. Now, I should also point out, we do need to really see the connectivity. One needs to go down to the EM level, to the electron microscope level. Uh, light microscopy cannot quite resolve the details and see the fine connectivity.
uh, light microscopy can do many other things, image live. Uh, so these, all these techniques are very complementary and uh, support each other. So what is this FibSim? This is uh, basically an instrument where you use FIB, which is a focused ion beam, and it basically abrades away the surface a few nanometers at a time. Uh, the advantage of an ion beam is the abrasion is just a little bit finer, more controlled in the Z dimension. Otherwise, it's very similar to what Mark was talking about earlier, the serial block face cutting. After you abrade or remove a little layer, you image the surface with a scanning electron beam, and then you ablate again, and you cycle through this about every minute. And you keep going and going for as long as you possibly can. And in the end, you gradually reconstruct uh, a circuit. In this case, if you're looking at a semiconductor chip, you can see all the la metal layers inside. If one's looking at a, well, fly brain, then, then you should get a three-dimensional reconstruction of all the details inside. So this here is the uh, outline of one of these synapses. The black part is actually uh, the membrane itself. Ah, and there you can see. So what you saw, uh, you know, time here is uh, moving in in Z, and you'll see on the left picture right there, the dark spots, those are actually the synapses. They're pretty small. And this is a typical fan in circuit. There are multiple synapses going all onto one dendrite. Uh, and you see the opposite in the fly, fan ins, fan outs. There are just a variety of structures uh, that are all uh, visible. It's uh, more complex than it is for a mammalian brain. So we got one of these machines and started out. And uh, so we ran it. Three days later, it came to a grinding halt and stopped. And so we imaged one one thousandth of a brain and uh, couldn't continue, there are problems. And so we came to this conclusion. <laughs> FIPSEM's irrelevant because it can't image anything useful. I continued to be employed <laughs> and worked on the next problem, five years of reliability engineering. Basically to handle all of these interrupts as they happen, can we anticipate things, make graceful stops if things bad is going to happen, mitigate damage control, and we can we start without loss of anything? Uh, the bar is very high because if you have a gap in this dense interconnect of wiring, there's no way that you can connect the wires from the left half to the right half, and your circuit diagram is just useless. So you don't want to be there imaging several years into the project and then say, oops. So a few years later, here we are imaging now for about a, uh, a three months project. That is looking at the optical lobe. You might have noticed three pieces, uh, the medulla, lobular, and lobular plate. And this is sort of what you see inside a, a fly brain. This is the, the motion you see is, again, is moving uh, in Z deeper and deeper. Uh, initially, the width was about 120 microns. Uh, it's about the width of two human hairs and zooming in about 10x. And we can look at detail, and for example, right there, that's a synapse. And it's connecting this dendrite over to several other guys on the other side. You know, it's all very subtle. And it's, uh, you know, it's a big challenge to, uh, to try to pull all of that information out and segment it. So it took us three months to image this, and then we gave it to some other people, and about three years later, they processed the data. Processing it and analyzing it is by far the bigger challenge. Uh, this, is, this is not easy, and it requires a lot of hand effort, or did require a lot of hand effort to segment, curate, make sure the, there's no mistake in there. And what we're doing here is dense segmentation. We're getting pretty much all of the processes, all of the neurons, identifying them, and then you can pull them out one by one, and you find that they have their own unique shapes and sizes, and uh, compare them to what is known from other experiments. For example, uh, yeah, some of these neurons are, you know, this is coming in from the retina. Some of them are sensitive to an on transition, or to an off transition, or to a left to right motion, or front to back motion. 
and uh, people can identify that uh, based on optical imaging. But optical imaging can't tell you the detailed synaptic connectivity, but it can give you the classes of neurons so one can connect the two and, and bootstrap our way forward. In addition, optical imaging can look at live samples too and tell which ones are firing on on transitions and off transitions, and we can actually monitor that. So all of that data can be put together, and you can begin to identify the components of a circuit diagram. And these are the three major parts that you saw earlier, the medulla, the lobula, and the lobula plate. Up here is the retina. The thing is with the uh, FibSem, it allows you to make the last little connection, which is to ask, here's one neuron, which we know reacts to a left to right on transition. What are its inputs? And you can define the neurons that are responsible for that, characterize those independently, and we make this uh, last step. And then you can begin to test models of the circuit. Is this a coincidence detector uh, based on excitatory inputs? Is it uh, a different version of that, uh, a NOR detector, where you might have an inhibitory input on one side? And it turns out that it's a little bit of a combination of both are present in the fly brain, and you can even sort of uh, get estimates of what might be causing the delay based on uh, length on the synapse. So having this extra level of detail helps close a lot of open gaps. So, so far we still haven't gotten to the full fly brain, uh, and we reverted to another technique uh, called hot knife sectioning to get all the way up. Imagine the fly brain, you chop it up into like a loaf of bread into about 30 pieces, uh, each about 20 nanometers thick. You put it on a little laminated uh, surface, and you have about 30 of these tabs and feed them in to a bunch of machines. And this puts us in the range of getting these, uh, this eight FibSem year effort maybe down to a little bit more reasonable uh, time. And we are gearing up and trying to expand uh, toward, toward this direction here. And so far, over the past two years, we've come just a, a little ways along that path. Uh, looking in here, we have what we've accomplished uh, called the HEMI brain. Uh, it aspires to be half a brain, but it's a little bit shy of it. It's on a female fly, but it's uh, unilateral over a good part of it. Uh, misses some aspects, you know, not too much on the optic lobe, missing the parts below, which are associated with feeding and uh, appetite. Uh, but a lot of modules are in there. Uh, the central complex, uh, which is associated, which is a sort of a uh, an internal compass for the fly, and people are studying that independently. Uh, olfactory learning in the mushroom body, lateral horns, uh, all these names are dear to bi biologists studying different parts of the fly brain. And here's what that looks like. That big round circle, the donut that you saw, that's the ellipsoid body, and uh, that's associated with its uh, navigation, sort of uh, internal compass of the fly. And here we're just sort of flying through the data and you can just sort of see the complexity. Here we're getting pretty close. At this you know, resolution, this isn't as beautiful as what Mark has with a dedicated uh, high-res microscope. But what we're doing right here, as we fly in and out, that's going across that section. We have to make sure that section has good enough quality that we can match the dendrites from one side to the other without loss, and that's, that, that's critical. And I'll, I'll just let this uh, play a little bit. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing that this thing self-wires, and it looks so disorganized, but in the end, it really is organized. And there are the different modules. We're zooming back out. Here you can see the whole upper head of the fly, fly brain there. And remember, these are several slabs, and we're just gonna go through six of them. We have 13 altogether. This represents about two years of imaging that we've done, which has sort of completed this. And what will come next after this, we want to go over, try looking at a male fly, but doing it now in its entirety uh, all the way, and there'll be a, a larger imaging effort. And here we are back to the uh, central complex. So what's next? That data is not good enough by itself. It needs some processing, and it goes off to uh, experts, computer science experts who use neural nets, and there have been a lot of fascinating developments in the past few years of uh, 
what they can, how quickly they can extract it. So they're now maybe at the level where instead of taking 10 times longer than imaging, they might almost be able to keep up and pull out the nerves and get these connectivity diagrams of what nerve connects to what out of the thousands, hundreds of thousands of different nerves in there and give those to biologists so that can be correlated with all the other information that they work with. So I'd like to put this technology, this FibSim, on a little diagram like this, just to show where it might fit in the, into the world. The bottom axis is size. We're looking at relative larger size structures. It's getting close to a, um, a millimeter, a little bit below that for the fly brain. And the vertical axis is resolution. There's some techniques out there, as Mark talked about, which can get much better resolution, but the size is going to be a little bit more limited. And we're playing this trade-off between size and resolution. And I think FibSim has a little bit of a sweet spot and FlyBrain sort of demands some of those, uh, those attributes. Now, the FibSim can also be used for in a different modality where you can uh, operate it with lower current. And in there, one might be able to image, let's say, a whole cell with higher resolution. The whole cell smaller in volume, but higher resolution. And images, instead of being blurry like this, can be somewhat crisper. And we can see a more detail of the synapse in the bottom uh, slide over here, like right down here. Uh, Postsynaptic uh, vesicles over here, individual ribosomes can be imaged. And at the top, we can even see microtubules. This is uh, just a random piece of mammalian cortex and uh, one can take out a part of that, segment it, similar to what Mark has shown, and you can get all the intercellular organelles, uh, endoplasmic reticula, the mitochondria, and mine it for, you know, for various uh, you know, details. Or at the bottom, maybe even label all the vesicles. Uh, you know, it's a little bit up to the biologists how they begin to mine uh, this kind of information, but it is accessible. So where do we go from here? I think next, you know, we'll continue on trying to acquire the, the fly brain atlas. It's going to be a little bit of a, a longer term effort. And, uh, you know, that'll be then combined with all the neural uh, processing, you know, to get the synaptic uh, details and uh, the connectivity diagram. And then that'll be absorbed by other scientists to, uh, with light imaging and uh, behavior to really understand the, the circuitry. I think going on to the next level beyond that, after we have one nice complete brain, you begin to look at differences. And I think this will be a, another exciting phase uh, for this field where we look at fly to fly difference. In the semiconductor industry, if you want to do failure analysis, you do die to die. Two computer chips, take two images, subtract them from another. If there's a difference, that's an error, you throw it out or you know where the, the problem is. Here, we have to do a, a similar version, fly to fly. And so, and the differences could be in development stage, not being overwhelmed by all the background, or is there experience, is there memory, can we pull it out, is it gonna be represented in this EM data or not? Uh, but I think it'll be just, you know, fascinating time. Thanks for your attention. So uh, what I'd like to tell you about today is our efforts to get a high temporal and spatial resolution of changes in membranes in the cell. And what we're doing is uh, using electron microscopy with a technique that's called flash and freeze. And the key to this technique is to be able to synchronize the cell at a particular time and then look at events that occur afterward. And so um, we've come up with two methods for synchronizing cellular activity. The first is light stimulation, and the second is electrical stimulation. So I'll tell you about both of those. So the way a synapse works is shown here. I think a lot of you are familiar with that. This is the uh, vision of Bernard Katz. And here's the cell body of the neuron, and an action potential travels down this axon and then invades the bouton, the presynaptic bouton. And what that does is open voltage-gated calcium channels, and calcium channels then open up and cause the fusion of synaptic vesicles, 
filled with neurotransmitter to fuse with the plasma membrane and release those molecules onto ligand-gated ion channels on the postsynaptic surface. And so at the time, this was not uh, believed. Uh, it was thought that these synaptic vesicles that were observed did in fact contain neurotransmitter, but they were lower, lo just uh, storage organelles for um, neurotransmitter. And the reason was that no one had seen these vesicles actually fuse with the plasma membrane after a stimulus, and so it wasn't clear that this part of um, the hypothesis was correct. And it took some 23 years before um, that was proven. And that was proven by the work of, uh, of John Heuser and Tom Reese because they built a really cool instrument called the freeze slammer. And that's what's shown here. So they have a piece of the frog pectoral muscle, which is really thin and can freeze very rapidly. Uh, and then they have um, nerves that are still attached and wrapped around stimulating wires. And these stimulating wires, went, this whole apparatus was attached here to this rod, uh, and the stimulating wires went up and could be connected to a circuit. And so what they could do then was release this uh, solenoid, and then as the bar was following through space, they would calculate five milliseconds before it hit a copper block cooled to four Kelvin, stimulate the motor neurons, which would then cause an action potential, which would then uh, cause the release of neurotransmitter uh, at the neuromuscular junction. And then they could ask whether the vesicles actually fused. And this is the image they got out of that. Absolutely spectacular. So here is a frog neuromuscular junction, which has not been stimulated. You can see that there are vesicles that are docked at that surface. And it, stimulated and then frozen five milliseconds later, you see these beautiful fusions that are taking place that, of the synaptic vesicles fusing with the plasma membrane and releasing neurotransmitter. So Katz's quantal and hy uh, vesicle hypothesis was thereby proved. But uh, Tom and John also recognized that there was another problem. And that is that there was a limited number of synaptic vesicles at a synapse. And so uh, at a neuromuscular junction, maybe there's 300. Uh, and a mouse neuromuscular junction can fire at 100 times a second. So at these rates, you can see that the synaptic vesicles could be rapidly consumed. Uh, and then you would exhaust the synapse and it would no longer be functional. And so they uh, then were convinced that these synaptic vesicles had to be recycled locally. It would take a week for vesicles to be transported down the axon to replenish uh, a synapse. So there had to be local recycling. And so what they did was they used their freeze slammer once again. Uh, and um, now, instead of freezing five milliseconds after stimulation, would freeze one second, and then two seconds, and 10 seconds, 15 seconds, uh, to 30 seconds, and then look at each of those stages and see whether they can see membrane being taken back in. Now, this is a freeze fracture. So what they've done is they've taken their ice block, and they've hit it with a wedge on the side. And that ice block will break where the weak parts are. So where are the weak parts? It's where the lipid bilayers are. So there's no covalent bonds between those lipid bilayers. Everything else is frozen and stuck together. So when they strike the block, it splits at the lipid bilayer. They can coat that uh, with an electron-dense material, take those replicas, and put them in the electron microscope. And this is what they saw. At zero milliseconds, that is an unstimulated synapse, you can see these little buttons, and those are likely to be calcium channels. At five milliseconds after stimulation, they could see these indentations, and these are vesicles that are on the other side of the screen, right? We're looking at the face of the synapse. Those are now fusing with the membrane and creating these dimples. Then they looked at one second and, uh, you know, for three seconds, 10 seconds, and so, uh, so on, and they saw nothing. And it wasn't until 30 seconds that they began to see these proteins would come together and form clusters, and then they would be pulled inside. So you see these little dips. This one in particular is beautiful because you can see the neck um, where it broke off because, of course, you can't break into that um, concave surface. When they looked at uh, cross sections, they saw that these invaginations were coated with this electron-dense material, uh, and it had been seen before. This is clathrin. And so uh, they now um, were able to say that at synapses, after stimulation, that vesicles or membranes uh, from that are lost to the plasma membrane are recycled via this clathrin-mediated process, and the process is rather slow. It takes about 30 seconds. So we have revisited those experiments, and I think we see another process that's occurring. 
Uh, we call this ultra-fast endocytosis, and in this case, we see that the membrane is removed from the surface between 50 to 300 milliseconds in a mouse neuron. Uh, this then generates a synaptic endosome within one second. These are butted by clathrin into mature synaptic vesicles that can be refilled and reused in five seconds. So the process that we're observing is much faster than what uh, had been observed by Heuser and Rees. So uh, the ex the, when we started these experiments, we needed to, uh, the way to replicate the freeze slammer. We needed to freeze the samples uh, as quickly as possible. And it needed to be deep, because the first in, uh, organism that we did this in was C. elegans. And so it's uh, 80 to 100 microns thick. So we needed to have a frozen sample all the way through. So the way the high pressure uh, freezer works, it goes from one to 2,000 atmospheres in 15 milliseconds. So the water molecules are vibrating around, but under high pressure they become sluggish. And if you can drop the temperature fast enough, then you don't have time for those molecules to reorder themselves and then uh, generate ice crystals. Ice crystals will shred your cells, so there will be no morphology left. And so by doing this, um, we're able to freeze the sample without any distortions from ice crystals. So uh, we're doing this, the, the experiments I'm going to show you here are not done in uh, C. elegans in the nematode. They're done in cultured hippocampal neurons. Uh, and so now what we need to do is we have these in the high pressure chamber, but we need some way to initiate a depolarization that will then initiate that action potential and then stimulate this synapse so that we can look for vesicle fusions and endocytosis at that synapse. And the way we're doing that is with channel rhodopsin. So channel rhodopsin uh, is a light activated ion channel. Uh, so um, when you stimulate it with 470 nanometer uh, light, you can then open that channel and sodium will flow into that neuron and then cause an action potential. So we now have a way to stimulate an action potential in a neuron that's deep inside this high pressure chamber. So let me just show you that this actually works. Uh, here is a neuron that's expressing channel rhodopsin. This is an on-cell configuration. Uh, we stimulate with light, and here is the light stimulus. It's 10 milliseconds long, and you can see these beautiful action potentials that are occurring during the light stimulus. Usually there's just one, but in this case we see that there are two action potentials occurring. We can then move that pipette to a uh, postsynaptic neuron that is not expressing channel rhodopsin, so it will not be stimulated by light, um, but it will receive inputs from this neuron. So we flash the light, that um, now uh, fires an action potential, and what we can see are these postsynaptic currents. These are synaptic currents, they're beautiful, uh, and you can see in this case we also had two action potentials uh, that were leading to this postsynaptic current. So then we now have uh, a neuron that's expressing channel rhodopsin in our high pressure chamber, uh, but we need to get a light path into that chamber. And so uh, we modified the, uh, the Leica high pressure freezer at the time. Uh, and so it is composed of this structure here. So here's the specimen cup. That's where our uh, neurons are going to go. And it's held in place by a bayonet. Uh, and this bayonet will then fire down a rail into the high pressure chamber, the chamber will close, and then uh, it fires uh, and freezes the sample. So what we did was, uh, we, there's, here's this little cup that holds the neurons, there's a black diamond anvil here, um, and the pressure comes here and slams that against that black diamond anvil and creates 2,000 atmospheres. Liquid nitrogen flows around on either side to freeze the sample. So what we did was we replaced that sapphire anvil, the black anvil with a sapphire anvil. Uh, we then drilled out that mounting screw and we drilled out uh, the bayonet so that we had an LED right at this point and now we have a light path to the sample. So the experiment now is quite simple. We're going to provide a 10 millisecond light stimulus and then we'll freeze at 15 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds, et cetera. And um, these were the first images we got, and we were extremely excited by these because they're just beautiful. So if we freeze 15 milliseconds after the stimulation, we see vesicles fusing with the plasma membrane. It's just, isn't that beautiful? It's collapsing into the membrane. Here at 30 milliseconds, almost fully collapsed into the membrane. So we can capture those very rapid events caused by an action potential causing vesicles to fuse.
So what about recycling, right? Remember, it took 30 seconds in the Heuser and Reese experiments. And we came up, we saw he had a huge surprise when we saw that uh, recycling of the membrane was occurring uh, on the scale of 100 milliseconds. So here's the active zone. That's where vesicles are fusing. Uh, and at the lateral edge, at 50 milliseconds, you can already see this invagination that's building. At 100 milliseconds, it's much deeper. And this one, you can actually see some electron-dense material. The membrane is being cut from the surface. So that is the act of endocytosis. Uh, and then at 300 milliseconds, you can see that the vesicle has been completely cleaved from the membrane. So uh, we can now calculate the time during which endocytosis is taking place. Uh, and that is seen by, uh, by quantifying the number of each of these structures we see. Uh, we see the first pits at 30 milliseconds. Uh, then we see um, large vesicles form at 50 milliseconds. We see the last pits forming at 300 milliseconds. And so that determines the first presence of vesicles and the last presence of the appearance of vesicles. So endocytosis is taking place between 50 to 300 milliseconds. So this is a tomogram. Uh, and it's really an important image, so I want to spend a minute on it. So what we've done here is done a, telt, a tilt series uh, and reconstructed the electron densities inside that thick section. And uh, we have now drawn this membrane, the presynaptic membrane, slightly transparent. You can see the postsynaptic density, which is shown in red, uh, through that membrane. And so that defines um, where the synaptic vesicles are being released and where the receptors are on the other side. In this synapse, you can see that there are three synaptic vesicles fusing at this point in this active zone. Look here, already you can see these invaginations that are taking place at the lateral edge of the synapse. This means that the membrane that is in the synaptic vesicle and is fusing is not the same membrane that is being taken up by ultrafast endocytosis. Here at 100 milliseconds, the, uh, the, the fusions have fully collapsed into the membrane. Uh, here's one of those shallow invaginations, and here's one that's being cleaved from the surface, the act of endocytosis. So we're able to then follow what happens to this membrane later. Uh, and what you can see is that it is transported to the back of the synapse, and it makes these large synaptic endosomes shown here. And then this synaptic endosome is then cut apart by a clathrin into individual synaptic vesicles. And here is a 3D view of that. Uh, and if we just focus on one of these um, buds, uh, when you just look at the densities, you can see that, in fact, there's a clathrin uh, geodesic dome or buckyball forming around one of these vesicles. So uh, that was great. We have, were able to see this new process called ultrafast endocytosis. Um, but it came under a lot of criticism. Uh, and I, I think it, it, it valid. It's valid it, if you're trying to make a major claim here. One of our reviewers said that there are 40 years of experiments uh, that suggest that um, clathrin-mediated endocytosis is the mechanism by which synaptic vesicles are recycled. Uh, and um, there's probably 10,000 papers. And now there's one paper that says it's not the way it works. So one of the, the major thing people were focusing on is that we were seeing four synaptic vesicle equivalents being endocytosed. And so why, and it would, the dogma is that there's only one vesicle fusing. There are people who think that that's not true, that they're multivesicular release, but nevertheless, that's uh, how people imagine the synapse works. And they all hinged on the fact that we were using channel rhodopsin instead of electrical stimulation, which is what everybody else uses. And so, and I actually have to thank my um, critics because they were relentless, um, but they're well-meaning because all of these cri uh, criticisms were told to my face at meetings, and they said, you got to figure this out. And so the ideas were that there was an excess depolarization by channel rhodopsin. That's possible. Uh, there's increased membrane fluidity by channel rhodopsin, uh, but also possible. Uh, and that there was calcium influx by channel rhodopsin as well, and that was leading to these greater responses in this unusual form of endocytosis. So the solution is obvious. Come up with a way to stimulate these samples electrically, and we call this zap and freeze. So, and I have to give credit to my uh, senior research fellow who came up with this, Wayne Davis. He said, this is what your middle plate looks like in the, in the center of that high pressure chamber. 
and the sample is held right here. And so the light comes in and stimulates that sample and causes the neurons to fire action potentials. So he said, why don't you just move the uh, sample holder, the sample cup, to this lateral position, add uh, stimulating leads, uh, add capacitors that will c carry a charge, and then add a light-activated switch so that when uh, you now take this, insert it into the high-pressure chamber, the light will stimulate that switch and then cause a depolarization of the cells in your sample uh, and cause action potentials. And so this is what we did. This is what this thing looks like. It is a independent little circuit board that fits deep into the high pressure chamber. Uh, you can see the capacitors here, and here is where our specimens go, and then the leads are on either side. And so these are the images, the first images that came from this device. Uh, here is an unstimulated sample, and then here is a stimulated sample. This is one action potential at 1.2 millimolar calcium, so this is physiological. And you can see that there are three vesicles that have fused with the membrane and are collapsing into the plasma membrane. So this is frozen after a single stimulus and frozen 11 milliseconds after the pulse. So what about ultrafast endocytosis? So now what we've done is we stimulate once, it's a one millisecond pulse, and then we freeze 100 milliseconds later. And now again, here's the active zone, postsynaptic density is marked here, and here is an invagination, here is an invagination, here is an invagination, and here's another invagination at the lateral ledge, edge of the uh, active zone, once again showing that ultrafast endocytosis takes place even with electrical stimulation. So uh, here's the quantitation of that. Uh, here's an unstimulated sample, and here is a sample stimulated 100 milliseconds earlier, and we see the presence of these endocytic pits and endocytic vesicles. So it looks like ultrafast endocytosis takes place along with, uh, um, well, we'll see uh, uh, when uh, clathrin-mediated endocytosis occurs, but we see these very fast responses that disagree with what people have been seeing in hippocampal neurons. So the issue is why do our results differ from those who have been imaging uh, uh, hippocampal neurons in the past? And I think we know the answer now, and the answer is temperature. So we did all of our experiments at either 34 degrees, because that's where electrophysiologists uh, like to record, or 37 degrees, which is physiological for the mouse. And when we do that, we see these large endocytic vesicles forming, uh, and we see ultrafast endocytosis. When Shigeki did his experiments at 22 degrees, you now see that clathrin-mediated endocytosis takes over. So you can see a clathrin coat there. Here's an, here's an enlargement of that beautiful clathrin coat. So what we think is going on is at 34 degrees, we see normal, uh, we see ultrafast uh, endocytosis, and then uh, at 22 degrees, we see a clathrin coated pits and clathrin mediated endocytosis. So in conclusion, we think that uh, at normally uh, we have ultrafast endocytosis, removing membrane from the surface after action potentials, and then in the absence of ultrafast endocytosis, there's an emergency backup system, which is clathrin mediated endocytosis. And with that, I would just like to thank uh, the people who did the work. All of the electron microscopy was done by Shigeki Watanabe, who has his own lab now at Johns Hopkins. Instrumentation was from Wayne Davis. I'd really like to thank the people at Leica, particularly Tsveta Tomova. They provided us with every one of their instruments every summer at MBL, and they would say, do whatever you want to it. We just need to take a picture of it at the end of the summer. And so I have no financial interest in Leica. Uh, we turned over all intellectual property to Leica, and so these things are now available commercially, and you can use them. And then finally, my host in Berlin, uh, Christian Rosemann. And thank you for listening. All right, so the, the question that we are studying in my lab um, is how does something as complex as the brain um, form in the course of embryonic development? How do the first circuits develop? How do they become functionally active? Um, how do they perform the first computations and instruct the first behaviors? And so because all of these um, aspects are highly dynamic aspects, um, um, we, we spent quite a large fraction of our time actually also developing technology that allows us to visualize and also measure um, at the cellular level and, and uh, at even smaller scales what's happening um, uh, during, during the development and the emergence of function in the nervous system.
And so um, I'd just like to start with two examples of microscopes and imaging assays we've developed uh, for this purpose. Um, what you can see here is um, a life imaging experiment with a nuclear labeled uh, Drosophila embryo going through embryogenesis. And um, we can basically follow um, all of the different cells um, as they move and divide and specifically reconstruct the formation of the early nervous system. So this sort of structure is the equivalent um, of, the, um, of the vertebrate spinal cord that's being formed here. So we have this, this lineage reconstruction and the you know, morpho morphodynamic building plan um, of the early nervous system. Now, complementing this developmental perspective, we also like to capture what's happening in the, in the individual neurons once the nervous system is really up and running. Um, and so we need tools that are even faster. Um, now we're imaging at 100 times higher speed and even larger volume. This is the, the brain of the larval zebrafish. Uh, we have about 100,000 neurons. And using calcium indicators, we can, and we can follow their activity um, uh, during different types of behaviors. And so from these whole brain functional imaging uh, recordings, we can then figure out what kind of circuits are involved in certain types of behaviors um, and what kind of networks across the brain are, are communicating with each other and are jointly involved in certain types of computations. And so um, I, I chose these two examples also because in both of these cases, these imaging experiments marked the first time that an analysis like this was possible. This was the first time that um, we could actually track cells systematically across a high end vertebrate, and the first time that we could image neural activity at the cellular level um, across a vertebrate brain. And what's, what's made it possible to do these types of, uh, um, you know, to record these types of data sets, to do these types of analysis, is the, is the concept of light sheet microscopy. So I'll, I'd just like to remind you very briefly what the, the key concept is behind this technique. Um, it's actually a very old technique. It's been around for one and a hundred years, makes it twice as, twice as old as confocal microscopy. And to the present day, um, you know, the fundamental concept has basically remained the same. What we're doing is we're illuminating a, a, a sample with a thin sheet of light, uh, of laser light that we are that is entering the sample chamber from the side. So we're selectively illuminating a thin volume section in the sample. And then the fluorescence that is emitted by the thin section um, is imaged with a conventional wide field detection subsystem oriented at a right angle to this incident light sheet. So we have this, this, um, this detection objective and then a camera further, further up in that arm that takes a snapshot of that plane, of that thin section. And so that makes this technique a very fast imaging technique because we can, with one snapshot, we can capture millions of volume elements across this plane. Um, and we can do rapid 3D imaging by just moving the light sheet through the sample step by step, just recording the image sequence. Um, and so then we're basically just limited by the, by the speed of the detector, the camera um, can get gigavoxels per second with, with modern SCMOS cameras. But it's also a very gentle technique. Um, and so it's gentle because we are only sending light exactly to the part of the sample that we're taking the image of at any point in time. We're not sending light to out of focus regions. Um, we're not bleaching or damaging parts out of focus. And so this combination is really important for our work. And so now I'd like to be a little bit more quantitative about the imaging experiments I just showed you on the first two slides. Um, and as a reference, um, you know, just in, in, you know, embed this, um, basically embed these experiments in, in, in a parameter space that we would care about a lot in, in most of these live imaging experiments where you're looking at the size of the sample we can image, the duration for which we can image it, and, and the spatial and temporal resolution we can achieve. And so as a reference point, now just connecting to, to Daniel's talk again, I think Daniel made this, this nice point that if you use a state-of-the-art spinning disk uh, confocal microscope, a very powerful, you know, fast imaging device, you can still kind of do this experiment of, of tracking cells in a, in a C. elegans embryo, but only up to a certain point of time. If you go too far into development, and, and uh, the embryo moves so quickly that you can't follow these cells anymore. But so this is kind of like at the limit of the performance of the system. And so that puts us somewhere here in this parameter space. And so I'm, I'm sure you've heard of the work um, of my colleague, Eric Betzig at Chanelia, who is also using light chain microscopy to push spatial resolution um, in, in these experiments. And it, so he is able to get these really dramatic improvements in spatial resolution of more than a factor of 10, same model system. And so using these really, really thin light sheets, either using Bessel beams or lattice light sheet techniques. So for us, the challenge has been a different one. Um, we wanted to stay at the single cell level, but scale this up to a much, much larger uh, model system. So for the Drosophila, we were imaging at 1,000 times larger volume, we still want to f follow cells at the same speed, at the same volume rate. And then if you push it into the functional realm, um, we need to image not only a 1,000 times larger volume, but also image that volume at a 100-fold faster volume rate. So this is where light sheet microscopy has been really helpful to us. But if you look at these different data points in this plot, there's one thing that's really 
unsatisfying about it. And that's, there's seemingly, the implication here is that there, there's seemingly this, this trade-off. You know, you can either image a fairly small sample at very high resolution or a fairly large volume, you know, sort of at, 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 cell, at a cellular level very, very, very quickly, but you can't do both at the same time. And so I think what we really want is a technique that allows us to image a, a fairly large volume, you know, like, a, like at the brain of a, of a, of a larval zebrafish, over long periods of time, um, um, over the mental time scales, you know, during, during behaviors, um, at both at high spatial and high temporal resolution. And so, so I'd like to show you first this and basically how we can get to this part in the parameter space. And so the, the, the goal here is really to find a way um, to add this fourth parameter and you know, three out of the four parameters we're kind of happy with. We have the large volume, we have the high speed, um, the, you know, but, but what is missing is the spatial resolution. So how we can add, how can we add spatial resolution to this mix without uh, trading off um, sacrificing any other parameter? So, well, let's look at the challenge first. What's the problem we need to solve? The reason why spatial resolution is not as high as we would want it to be in these experiments is that we suffer in, in many light microscopes, in fact, from anisotropic spatial resolution. So the problem here is that we are not really collecting all of the light that is provided by our object. Um, so you have a limited, limited numerical aperture, only collecting light under a certain small angular range. And so this anis anisotropy and sampling information um, results in an anisotropy in the way in which we form the image and represent the, uh, represent the, the samples. We have typically much lower axial resolution than lateral resolution, as Daniel pointed out earlier. So ideally what you would want to have is axial resolution be as good as lateral resolution. Um, so that would be a big step forward. I mean, light shape microscopy often has a factor of 10 that we're talking about. Um, and then on top of that, it would be biologically much more meaningful because we're treating all of the dimensions the same way, which makes much more sense. So what we need to find now is a way to solve this problem without compromising any of the other aspects of our performance because for our experiments it's really important that we can maintain the high temporal resolutions, we can still stay in the realm of calcium imaging, you know, maybe even push this forward towards voltage imaging in the future. So we really don't want to touch speed and still you know, get imaging at the, at the whole brain level. So the way we can do this um, is that we, we combine light sheet imaging with another uh, fairly old concept and that's the concept of multi-view imaging. Um, so what we do in this, in, in this approach is that counterintuitively the first, uh, the first step is that we don't solve this problem of anisotropic resolution. We simply accept the fact that if you, let's say if you have a point-like object, we image that, we get this ellipsoid, so like this distorted representation. Um, so we have low resolution along the axial component, high resolution laterally. But then in the next step what we do is we rotate the sample by 90 degrees relative to the, to the, to the microscope. And so we record a second view of the same scene. And so now we have permuted the dimensions along which resolution is high and low respectively and taken together across these two images, we have actually all, almost all of the frequency content that we're interested in um, of our sample and we basically just have to register these two views, uh, combine them for example for a process called multi-view deconvolution and then we have this neisotropic spatial resolution. So, so that would be a powerful way to improve spatial resolution because we can just keep our microscope um, and, and our, the way in which we build our light sheets the way it is, and we just, basically the main challenge that we have to solve now is to find a way to record these multiple views at the same time. Then we haven't, you know, sacrificed temporal resolution. And so, Raghav Chichi, a postdoc in my lab, addressed this problem and built a microscope that can do that. And so here's the idea. Um, it's a little bit, the arrangement is a little bit more complex than this, this basic idea that I described, so we don't only have two views of the sample, we actually have four opposing objectives. Um, so it gives us four orthogonal views, um, that which simply means that we can scale this idea up to larger specimens that are not entirely transparent. Um, so for Drosophila and Zebra, which is actually very helpful also for mouse, mouse embryos that we are studying. But now the, the problem is if we send in four light sheets at the same time from all these four objectives and then take four images, right field images of these objectives, we violated the fundamental concept of um, the, the optical uh, sectioning um, uh, concept in light sheet microscopy. So we, we've actually sent in light in a way that we now illuminate out of focus structures with respect to uh, the respective other light sheets. So we get out of focus light, we, we basically degrade the image quality um, by doing this at the same time. So the way we can solve this is that we don't actually use light sheets in our light sheet microscopes. Um, what we do is we send in a very, very thin pencil beam um, and so then if you take this pencil beam and you, you scan it up and down very quickly, 
um, across your plane of interest, and you just keep the camera shutter open, you get the equivalent of a light sheet. That's like a scanned light sheet. Um, and so, what you know, if you use this concept now and uh, it, um, implement it in a way that the, the, the beams that come in from these different views are slightly offset in space, um, so we keep them maybe a couple of tens of microns apart, and then we scan them across their respective planes at a constant pace, so they maintain that same constant distance, so they never cross their paths in real space, then all we need to do is match this up with a set of confocal line detectors that really only detect the light that comes from that beam and blocks out the, the light that comes from the orthogonal beam that's slightly offset in space. It's just hitting the detector at the wrong spot, not where the rolling shot is at that lo at point in time. We have the same phase offset in our confocal line detectors. Everything is matched up and synchronized, um, and now we can scan four views at the same time without any signal crosstalk. So that's the key idea in what we call the isotropic multi-view light sheet microscope, the ICU microscope. And so here's the data we can get with this approach. Um, again, so like the, the low anisotropic resolution in the contributing views, but if you combine these views into, a, into one single image, this is the multi-view deconvolved image, we now have isotropic resolution. You can turn this in any way, and, um, and you, know, you don't have any perceived difference in spatial resolution. This is a, um, a G-camp expressing uh, Trosophila lava, you know, it actually came throughout the entire nervous system. And so let me just zoom in on, onto this cluster of neurons so you can actually see the impact on spatial resolution. Um, so in our contributing views, we have one dimension along which it's very hard to distinguish these individual neurons. They're just blurring into each other. In the other set of views, it's a different dimension, but same, the same problem. But then combining all this information into the ice view reconstruction, we now have high resolution from any view, you know, this along the X, X, Y, Z, and axes. Um, and so we basically restored cellular, cellular resolution even in these deeper regions of the nervous system. And so overall, we find we have about 400 nanometer spatial resolution. And so because we haven't sacrificed temporal resolution, we can now do these types of functional imaging experiments. Where, for example, imaging at the whole animal level, the entire um, Drosophila lama expressing in G-camp during motor behavior, as you can see forward-backward crawling, and then sort of concurrent calcium activity that is sort of orchestrating this, this, be this behavior uh, in the ventral nerve cores. So you see, see these waves um, in the VNC, and um, sort of a similar context in the zebrafish. So we have a, a lava zebrafish here that ex executing different types of swimming behaviors, and you can see this activity in the hindbrain and the spinal cord during these behaviors. Now, so this is imaged at two hertz, and this is at one hertz. And it's just rotating the fish here, so you can see if it, there's no change in resolution as we rotate the, uh, the volume. So I think live imaging is where this really unfolds its full potential. Uh, but you can, of course, also use it for structural imaging experiments with fixed samples. Um, and so the, so the main gain here is that you, you get isotropic resolution. You can image it very quickly. Um, so this is now an expanded Drosophila brain you know, combined with expansion microscopy. Um, so that makes it actually about you know, two millimeters um, uh, long along each side. Um, and so sort of within about 15 minutes, we get then 100 nanometer isotropic spatial resolution across the brain. There's sort of like a sparse pattern of uh, fruitless neurons that are labeled here. And so if you zoom in, you can see the fine structural details, which can aid conectomics types analysis um, in, in relatively high throughput with these imaging experiments. So let me just uh, summarize this. We have basically an improvement of about tenfold in resolution without sacrificing speed and field of view. And you know, more, in, more, in more absolute quantitative terms, that means 400 nanometer spatial resolution, system resolution, um, at sub-second time scales for a volume of about 800 micron cubed. And so I just showed you very short sequences from actually longer imaging experiments. We've imaged these samples for hours to days in each of these cases. So you can use it under physiological conditions in this parameter space. But one thing I'd like to point out is that intentionally I said system resolution here. So which means this is the performance we expect on ideal imaging conditions if you have a fairly transparent sample. And um, unfortunately, most of the samples we're looking at are far from transparent. And you know, we end in this realm of imaging relatively large uh, specimens for live imaging, um, Drosophila uh, lava, zebrafish brain. Um, they actually perturb the light that we need to use to rely on to do the measurement in the first place. Um, and so this is a problem we need to solve because the way it impacts our light sheet microscope is that because of the heterogeneity, the optical heterogeneity of the samples, so this kind of like this toy model of a cross section of, of uh, let's say, this, this drosophila lava, um, as the light sheets enter the sample, they are deviated from their light path uh, to change their course. Um, and 
And so this can change further inside the sample depending on the optical properties, can change over time, you know, as optical properties change as the sample develops. And the same thing happens in the detection process. So we have so we increasing curvature of the focal planes. They're not really clean planes anymore. They, they, get, they get banned as a function of the spatial location and as a function of time. And so bottom line is that we lose, we lose this you know, nice coplanarity that we rely on in the light sheet microscope, where the, the light sheet should be you know, coplanar with a focal plane to get an in-focus image. That's not really the case anymore, so we basically image out of focus and we get low resolution and low image contrast. And so, so Loic Royer, another postdoc in the lab, um, um, addressed this problem in the following way. I basically developed, first of all, so the, the, there are two components to this, to, this, to this solution. First of all, we need a microscope that has access to the degrees of freedom that are needed to bend things back into shape. We need to be able to rotate and translate the light sheets and the focal planes so we can actually fix the problem if we know what the problem is geometrically. And so the, the second part is that we need to measure, take the right measurements. We have um, algorithms deployed um, on the microscope that allows us to, to estimate image quality as a function of changes in these, in these degrees of freedom and basically build a model of the sample in the, back, in the background of the live imaging experiment to constantly improve in space and time the spatial relationship between uh, focal planes and light sheets. And so with this combined sort of adaptive imaging approach, um, we can now hand the experiment over to, uh, to this, to this um, real-time control layer and um, basically have it optimize the uh, image, image quality. And so in a, for example, in a, in a zebrafish embryo that has the following effect. If you look at different regions here, we're trying to track the cells as they form the nervous system. Um, we can't really, without the adaptive imaging, follow cells in many parts of the sample anymore. Over time, just image quality degrades. And uh, with the adaptive imaging approach, we can recover that high resolution. Um, we can also use it in a functional imaging context. Um, so this is now um, a zebrafish larval brain. Um, again, I'm showing you the quality with the adaptive imaging engaged and, and, and without this framework. And after some time of, of imaging, you can see how quality really degrades because the, the brain is growing, the fish is actually growing, and we're changing the optical, con uh, the, the optical context and losing the ability to uh, really accurately measure activity at a single neuron level. And with that, I'm at the end. Um, just like to give you a quick outlook, we um, are now integrating these imaging tools with optical manipulation tools. We don't only want to watch what's happening, we want to control what's happening, manipulate it. And so particularly with a, with a layer that allows us to classify behavior in real time so that we can in, you know, interact with behavior at different stages, at different phases, and for example, control the state that the network is in, control, for example, motor behavior from forward walking to backward walking and so on. And so that's the next stage now for this technology for us. And so with that, I'm at the end of the talk. And I'd just like to acknowledge very briefly uh, Raghav Chetu, who built the eyes of your microscope, Lloyd Royer, who developed this adaptive imaging framework, Bill did a lot of the imaging experiments, helped, helped a lot with these imaging experiments, and then we have a lot of fantastic collaborators at Chenelia that contributed a lot to the work that I showed you here, Misha Arns and Kristen Branson in particular, uh, to whom I'm very grateful. All right, thank you.